Hello and welcome to Brunner Talk. This is Mateusz Brunnerek speaking and I have something really, really amazing for you today. I can't even say how much of fun I had with this guest today. I invited Jared. Jared is a guy that I met in the office, in the co-working space, in the park. And it turned out that this dude is crazy. He's he's absolutely smart and he's kicking ass in the subject of creating startups. He's an amazing strategist and designer. And I was trying to uncover his thoughts and learn how he thinks, what he does, and how it all works. And I want to show you all this. Before we move on, I have to tell you that yes, we were drinking alcohol while recording this podcast. But here in this podcast, the interview and the questions, it doesn't matter. It has to be a really good and smooth conversation. So I hope that you don't mind that and that you will really enjoy this episode. But before we dive in, Let me thank our sponsors. This podcast is brought to you by MediaBro. Whether you need a marketing strategy, absolutely stunning branding design, like a new logo, kick-ass website that will impress all your customers, social media design, content and advertisement, including creating videos and pictures for your brand's needs to attract new clients and spread your offer. We are based in Stockholm and all you need to do is to go to mediabro.se, spelled M-E-D-I-A-B-R-O dot S-E, and contact us in any form that suits you. Remember, new customers are not going to find you until you show up and make them see how awesome you are. Okay, so before, before I even ask you what's your name, I have a weird question for you. People are running around in shipping booze. Sorry, yeah, it's Friday. <laughs> Friday, like almost 5 I p.m. So. I don't know how clear that's going to be on the camera, but there are people running back and forwards from, from fridges. There's like a kitchen right here, and there's another <laughs> kitchen at the other end. And it looks like people are trying to work out where they've stashed their beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But oh well, there is not, not so much different with what we are doing now. No, it's, it's <laughs> fine. It's Friday afternoon. It's the end of a big week. It's a good time for it. Yeah. Sorry, I completely got distracted by by the floating beers and I didn't <laughs> listen at all to your question. <laughs> no, there was no question yet. So Even better. Um I don't know almost anything about you. I just know that you're a super interesting person. That's why that's why we are here. You you've made you've made an assumption based on things that I rant about <laughs> while we sit at the same table. <laughs> yeah, like you know, when somebody's saying some smart stuff and he's funny, then I like this person. So why not to talk more about that? Some some smart stuff with that person, right? Perfect. So I, I appreciate that. You flatter me. <laughs> I'm happy. So tell me, I know that you you've invested in some companies. Uh, not not entirely. So I I work in that kind of sphere in that sphere in that space. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I don't personally make investments. I don't have a fund. I don't have uh, a portfolio of my own. The company that I work for has a portfolio of of companies, and that that's built up by um, either building those companies from the ground up because we think it's a good idea to make that make that exist, or it's because we will take equity in a business in an exchange for a mm-hmm. uh, what you would call sweat yeah. equity. So we, we, we work on a cost plus arrangement where we, we, we do the services required to build the thing mm-hmm. and our contribution to that business is equal to what would otherwise be the margin. So we, we only pay for our own costs as opposed to charging a market rate. Mm-hmm. So what's the biggest amount you invested as a company? Uh, again, we don't bring capital. We um, don't bring capital. Uh, you, know, to, you know, if you're like the biggest percentage of a company that we have would uh-huh. be the companies that we, we built from the ground up. So we've got a couple that we own still 100% of. Um, and we've got others that are, we've taken a bit of investment that we still retain like 85%. But they're cool. kind of, so it's, yeah, it's, we, we don't bring like a million dollars mm-hmm. of cash and, and, and bring it to the table. But we might provide, uh, you know, this the, the equivalent 
yeah. value worth yeah. of design and, and strategy and, and development services or, or more. Yeah, it depends on um, it depends on how we're how involved we are in a project yeah. and how big the scale and the ambition is. Uh, you can spend quite a lot of money you know, building and, and launching digital products of, of the kind of scale that we do. Like you, you think about a, a digital product mm-hmm. or an app and it's like, oh, it's just an app. It's just an iPhone app. But if you think about some things that are just iPhone apps, Spotify is one of my favorite examples because it's not just an app. It's of course. it's an entirely online, digital first ecosystem that includes sponsors mm-hmm. and advertisers and record labels and musicians and independent musicians. And it has a load of customers, both consumer and, and enterprise customers all around the world. It's a multi-million, multi-billion dollar business. Exactly. Um, it just happens to be an app. And and that's kind of what, what you find is when people say, well, how much does this app cost? Well, that depends on the scale of ambition. Uh, you can't really think about apps as, as the same as uh, you, you could in the in the early days of the app ecosystem in sort of the early part of the decade. There's a lot more involved now. Yeah, imagine that once I was going with Uber driver home here in Stockholm and he was talking that he's looking for programmers because he wants to build an Uber. Like he, he wants, wants to, to build he wants like to build he, a, an Uber competitor? Yeah. He wants to build an app like an Uber. And he thinks that the cost of that is like, you know, something a little bit more expensive than the website. So that's crazy. <laughs> well, well, it, it would be a little bit more expensive than a website, but a maybe, little little, <laughs> maybe a little bit more than, a, than, than, than you immediate, immediately think. Look, so uh, how much does it cost to build a, build the app? It's, it depends, again, it depends on the scale of the ambition. Yeah, you, know, you can throw you can, me something like, so, so yeah. a really good, a really good way to get some degree of a, a benchmark for this is, uh, I can't remember who did it. Um, but there's a, a, a group that I think it was General Assembly or something um, similar. They're, 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 do you know Gem- General Assembly at all? Not really. General Assembly run um, UX training, uh-huh. UX and digital design and mm-hmm. customer experience training courses. Um, and I think someone either from that course, I, I could be wrong by this. I'm trying to remember a thing that I found about it 12 months ago. I was trying to answer the same question. So I had a thing in my back pocket to talk to clients and customers and and partners um, to, to explain this conversation. Um, these guys looked at every feature that Facebook had and Instagram mm-hmm. had and Twitter had and a whole bunch of market uh, you know, household names in the digital app space. Mm-hmm. And if you knew exactly what you needed to do to build everything that was uh, that existed in Facebook in a digital space, they calculated it would take so many hours that it would work out to be about five hundred thousand dollars just to build Facebook. And it'd take you about five hundred thousand dollars U.S. And it'd take you about uh, I think two weeks to do it. So two That's weeks, nothing. Two two weeks. Oh, sorry, it's more than that. Uh, a couple of a couple of months maybe, and uh, and five hundred grand US to build Facebook. Now that works if you know exactly what you want to build, but it never is the case. And so that 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 is purely hundred percent execution costs. Mm-hmm. Before that, you need to work out what you want to build, and ideally, you you run. Yeah, you know, so you never. You never should run a project where you do 100% of the design and sign that off and then do 100% of the development. Mm -hmm. So what these guys were calculating is what they think the development costs would take. It's very difficult at this point to reverse engineer how much Facebook would have spent on design and Mm -hmm. and creating and and identifying and and iterating on on that design and that interface. so and it, and it's very difficult to pull a number out of the air to expect how much time we think that would take. Yeah, because probably they are calculating on Facebook version like one hundred something something, but it took them to make this one hundred versions of Facebook and these features and so on and so on. Yeah, that's so, the iteration. So the the value I find in looking at it like that is that you you just get an understanding of that if you're going to build a product of that kind of scale, um, mm-hmm. at that kind of complexity then you need to keep up your back pocket enough um, you know, enough budget to actually build the thing properly. Um, and, and remember this is as well, this was before GDPR was launched. This is about a year ago that this mm-hmm. I found this article. 
Um, it's more than that, actually, because I was still in Brisbane. So it was maybe uh, 18 months or two years ago. So on top of on top of that, you now have added security protocols and security measures and, yeah. and uh, things that need to be in, in place from an operational point of view. That's, that's separate to... So again, building an app is not also... It's also not the same as building a business. Mm-hmm. You've still got your business processes. You've still got... Uh, your your human of operation. Course. So there's there's other elements to it. You don't just build a, a digital thing and up it runs. Like the app is just like it's an interface. How many how think, many percent in the company would you say the app itself is? It depends on <clears throat> on what the company what the cost of the company do. What what we try and do when we're creating digital businesses is we try and get as much as possible into that digital space. Now what I mean by that is if you're looking at the costs of running a business, if you have a lot of costs that are reliant on 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 humans to do the work, whether mm-hmm. that's a, a human sales team or a human customer service team, then scaling up that business is going to require more human cost as well. And that's going to be hard to then grow that business at a, at a global or exponential rate. Mm-hmm. So what we try and do is we try and find opportunities for the digital product to do the heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. Most digital products that we build, we will have an app for, but you need to think of an app as an interface or a front door into your business, right? Mm-hmm. The same way that if you look at something like a, a supermarket, you know, the, the, the shop, the actual retail shop is just one facet of their business. Now, because you're most likely as a customer buying groceries at the at the shop, that's the a, a big portion of the costs of that business. But other portions uh, continue. Like so the camera just made a noise. Is that alright? <laughs> <laughs> the mm, viewers, like the people that are watching us on YouTube, won't have the fragment of video. But I didn't want to disturb you. My my beautiful camera has this feature that it stops recording after 12 minutes or something like that. Right, but the podcast is going, so All right, that's not I will just reset the camera in a second when you when you finish the <laughs> line. But it's taking you a little bit. So, um, what I what I was saying about that supermarket, the other facets of the supermarket are the distribution centers, the the trucks that ship things all around the country. Um, you know, the, you'll have a head office somewhere with all your marketing. So all of those kind of facets are important when you're creating a business and you need to keep those in mind as well. Building the app is never building the entire business. Building the business requires a lot more um, depth of thought and, and multifaceted approach. Uh, and you need to, again, be mindful of, of those as well because you're never done as soon as you finish the digital component of the business. There's, there's always more. Yeah. I can't That's even remember true. what the question was. <laughs> Me either, but there is n- it's not a point to, to, ask, <laughs> to answering the questions here. Um, let's have a break for a second. We, we didn't even say anything about you. We don't even know what's your name. Okay, okay. Hi, <laughs> I'm, I'm Jared. I, uh, Jared I'm who? Jared Fossey. Uh-huh. I'm a designer and I work for an Australian-based company called Joseph Mark. Great. Joseph Mark uh, started in Australia, expanded to the US in around, we've been, been around for like 14 years in Australia, around about five years in the US. We've had a, a presence and we've got a studio of about four or five people there now. Mm-hmm. And we've been in Stockholm for a little bit over a, a year, I think 14 or 15 months now. Mm-hmm. And we also partner with a strategy company called Business Models Inc., the guys who literally wrote the book on the business model canvas. And that's the organization that I'll be leading now called uh, Made in the Now as a joint venture between uh, Joseph Mark and Business Models Inc. And that's what I'm doing here in Stockholm, Mm -hmm. leading the joint venture called Made in the Now. Okay, that sounds very fancy. I'm leading some something, something bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) I see that you're sitting in front of the computer and playing uh, The Sims on the, no, The Sim City on on your phone. Not, not. just tell me what exactly you do. I know, I'm leading the team, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, so Made in the Now uh, works with either corporate organizations or consortium of uh, investors or venture capital 
to mm-hmm. set up a, a closed, sort of self-contained startup ecosystem mm-hmm. that can continuously produce digital ventures within a given theme. Mm-hmm. So when I say theme, we we have a methodology that goes from identifying ideas and opportunities to then ranking them and picking the, the, the most compelling ones to convert into strategy proposals and then doing the same thing again uh, to take only the, the most compelling and most valuable strategy proposals into prototype and development. Mm-hmm. And that is an adage that talks about how 90% of the startup uh, startups will fail. We want to eliminate that 90% before you invest in, in building and developing anything. Mm-hmm. What that means is if you're a if you're a, a corporate company or an investor, you can try and be involved in this and try and actually make a, a dent in the world without uh, having to worry about which is the right deal to be going for. Pretty much, every, we we take the responsibility to make sure that every opportunity that comes out of this venture lab is either a high or a medium growth potential. So it'll be a valuable addition to a, an investor's portfolio or it'll be a, a valuable way of leveraging a corporate company's existing IP or assets. So basically, the company you're working for is just like a, like a chicken that, We're brings, like, that brings only the golden eggs. That is, that is a uncanny that you picked that example. Uh, I don't understand that. what that means, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what I <laughs> what, why that's astounding to me that you say that is that's exactly what we use to to talk about us you know don't don't if you're an investor if you're uh, uh-huh. you know looking for don't go looking for the golden goose uh, sorry don't go looking for the golden egg you might get one egg but it's very difficult you know look for the golden goose that keeps laying the eggs that's what we do that's what we build and we build that in in vertical labs mm-hmm. for for given organizations. Um, Sometimes we partner with more than one organization, typically like non-competitive. So you could take like a logistics company and you could take like an IT company and together they might look at redesigning the future of work. Is, because, it, is it okay for you to say what companies you're working here in Sweden with? Uh, it's not really appropriate right now. Okay. Um, but watch this space. We, we uh-huh. have some very exciting conversations that... I. Uh, I have a personal, I get very excited, uh, and then I also have to put my PR hat on and um, keep myself in line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need more of these <laughs> here in the classes. Uh, no, I'm joking. Um, about about three times in the last 12 months, I have talked about something that I was very excited by because I thought we were... I thought we had published it or it had gone live and I was it was you know work that I'd worked on the strategy of and I was very excited to see it go out to the world and my PR director sent me a, a very concise <laughs> uh, and, and but very explicitly worded you were not supposed to talk about this yet yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh I'll uh, I'll I, I'll I'll keep you at the top of my my uh, mailing list when we have the announcements. That's perfect. I've already forgotten the word. What do you say? Nazdrovie. Nazdrovie. That's nuts. Say that to the microphone. Nazdrovie. Nazdrovie. Good stuff. That is really sweet. It is. <laughs> yeah, like usually we 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 have it after everything, like just to <laughs> you know, as a last after <laughs> breakfast, after. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what exactly you do? Like I don't know, do you go for a meetings with these big companies, or do you design stuff, or you lead the people, or I don't know. So my my role within Joseph Mark before I came over here was in what we call product strategy. Um, part of what I was doing <clears throat> in, in designing our full labs methodology would drop in and more specifically look at what we call uh, a recon. So the way our, our whole lab structure works is, I mentioned we have got the, 
the ideas that we start with were lots of ideas and opportunities, and then we would go and build strategy proposals, and then we would go and pick the best ones for development. I designed how we make strategy proposals. Mm-hmm. So we have a thing that's kind of like a, a design sprint, but it's more based on building a business. It's almost like a business design sprint or a strategy sprint. Um, are you familiar with sort of agile and, and sprint methodology? Yeah. Yeah. So but maybe you can just quickly, really quickly say something like for people who might not know. So, so the short version essentially is um, sprints are, are part of like an agile project management methodology terminology where you take a, peri- a, a time box period of time, usually one or two weeks, but it can be longer depending on the complexity of what you're playing with. Um, and within those two weeks, you pick tasks that you need to complete that you know you need to complete and you just only sprint on on that you sort of look at only what you and you want to end each sprint with a deliverable of some sort so that you know you've been successful in that sprint anything that you didn't achieve in that sprint gets pushed back to the backlog and then you can it it becomes on the the set of tasks to pick for the following sprint we've designed a specific strategy sprint with pretty much every task that we feel we need to complete in order to build an assessment over whether or not we think it's a, a quality idea or not quality business. Mm-hmm. Um, and I refer to this when I'm talking to clients and prospects like the opposite of a deep dive. It's not a deep dive because we don't have time in a sprint to look at any one thing in its full depth. It's a broad dive across every facet of a business that you would want to learn so that you have enough confidence to be able to actually propose it with with authority. So we look at who the customer is, what the market size is, what the trends are. Is that market segment growing? Is it a good opportunity because uh, there is some... Uh, low low value of the of the the existing like is there is a dissent with the current incumbent that everyone uses so you know we all hate Facebook great there's enough then is you know do we do we uh, are we not content with the existing market leader so that we can come mm-hmm. with a, a a significant competitor which is what Facebook did to MySpace which is what MySpace did to Friendster and so on and so forth so th- those kinds of things are what we look for to be clear that we've got an an idea that's a good idea we also look for what realistically it'll take to create a minimum viable product so we can go out to the world and and test and see if this is going to work as well as we think it is we can have the smartest strategy in the room but it doesn't mean anything if customers don't actually go for it and you can do a lot to to prepare yourself for market but Consumers always behave, market always behaves slightly differently to how you expect. The only way you'll ever find out is by actually taking it to the world. So we also have a specific, we we value ideas that we know we can get an MVP done in less than three months. Mm -hmm. If we can do that, then it's in a good space. It's not confirmed to go forward, but it's in a good space. If it takes longer than three months, then we start to have concerns because that's a long time to be putting into development of something before you get validation. So we want to, as fast as possible, get something that's going to give us, again, at the point of strategy, we just want confidence that we're onto a winner. Okay. Like, except of the the theory of chicken I said before, that you're like a chicken. Right now, you, you seem like you are, you know, there is a traffic, traffic jam. Yeah. And you are this, there is always a dick that... <laughs> goes on the like the security line or something like that and passes everybody to go in the front. It seems like you're just you're impatient which is like on in the business field it's like it's a good thing that you're doing. But you're just like you don't wanna you don't want you don't wanna wait, you don't wanna do things like everybody does. You just wanna pass the whole process. Just go in the what, front. What process do you mean? No, like, I don't know, like... You just don't go with this bootstrapping, with, the, you know... I have an idea, and I will develop this idea, whatever, like, whatever happens. And so, I dig so into the biggest, that. The biggest thing that we, that we champion 
is the separation from ideas and people. The problem that I, I've come across, I've been part of this problem, I've done this. Um, smart people and good people and perhaps good founders tend to keep ideas that, <laughs> that are not the best ideas alive for too long. Mm-hmm. There's a bit of a challenge that I have with the startup mantra, fail fast to succeed sooner, because a lot of people don't want to do that. They, they believe beyond, beyond everything that their idea is right and their idea is going to work. And a lot of founders need to believe that. And this isn't so much a criticism of founders as much as it is an, an alternative way of doing things, if that makes sense. There's okay. Just, so this this system, this framework that we have is not about entrepreneurism. It's not about it's not about being an entrepreneur. It's about creating ventures, but almost like doing it in a professional and a repeatable way where the ideas live or die by their own merits and they are measured by their quality as an idea, not by the quality of the person who came up with the idea. If that makes sense. Okay, but would you agree that the idea, like idea is nothing? Like idea is just, it doesn't give you anything until you actually do things. And what is more, how do you know that the idea will fail but that maybe you should just push a little bit more and it will be a success. And again, the way that we treat this is not that we think, the, the reason that we think an idea will fail is because almost every idea does. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's less about, and this isn't personal, right? This is never personal about anyone who's come up with the idea. Um, and, and killing ideas or killing early stage, you know, yeah, an idea is nothing. Ideas are cheap and we have lots of them and there are plenty of them. That's yeah. why for us, it's less about pushing an idea forward and trying to make it work or trying to adjust it or pivot it until it fits. Um, and for us, it's just more about picking the best idea, the most compelling idea. The idea that needs, starts off in the best place, that needs the least amount of tweaking in order to get to the most valuable position it can be in. Um, and again, for us, it's it's where we can best prioritize and spend our time and, and our resources developing with the, the highest hit rate of, of success. Yeah, you are constantly on the like fast lane. Yeah, we, we... You don't spend time on... Now, also, this isn't to say that the ideas that we don't prioritize are not going to be successful. They may be, but they might require a different route to get there that you don't want to take and that's that's just yeah that's just not the pathway that this is set up to mm -hmm. do this is designed to just cycle through build it launch it uh or if it's not working take the opportunity like for us working on an idea that isn't going to reach the growth potential that we want that's an opportunity cost i could take mm -hmm. that same dev team and deploy them on a different idea that will reach that so if as soon as we find out that idea an idea is not panning out the way we thought it was going to then we we raise that question proactively and we we pull that team back out and we reassign them onto an idea that's showing better promise um and it's brutal but that's the startup world anyway right? so, yeah um, it is brutal and and we've had people leave the company and follow the ideas because they want to take an idea through all the way. And that's that's fine as well. Do they success or do they fail? Uh, you know, it's different people have, have, the ones that have, have gone out have typically been the ones that have gone through the whole process, the whole methodology. Mm -hmm. And they've gone out the other end and it's already a succeeding business by the time they, by the time they go. That's typically what makes people want to follow through on the idea is because they put their, they their heart see. and soul into building it. And then it's built and then they're like, well, I don't want to give this to a client. I want to be the person that runs it. So yeah. uh, again, uh, there's a lot of questions that I get from people in the traditional startup game who are say, well, um, ventures need people. They need a CEO 
who's got blood, sweat and tears and their life force invested in making that idea work. And I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Um, we do that when ventures exit our lab, when they graduate. At that point, we hire a CEO we, or a product owner or whatever that is, and that becomes their job. Their, their job is no longer in the lab. If, that, if the person who runs that venture, once it graduates <clears throat> from one of our labs, if they are hired from internally, they want to work on the project after it leaves, that's awesome. And nine times out of 10, when that happens, the venture does very, very well, performs very well. Um, because it's got that, that degree of continuity. It's really valuable. It's frustrating for us because we have to backfill the person that, that left. Yeah. Um, but that's the way things go. Um, it's, yeah, it's just a different way of... It's, yeah, it's, it's not a criticism of the startup economy as much as it is a different and alternative way of doing something similar with more controls, um, different limitations. Uh, there are things that we can't do that or we choose not to do that the startup economy will, will allow for because there's no real rules in, in that world. Mm-hmm. We've put these rules because we think these are, these are the, the rules that set our framework up for the most likelihood of repeatable success. Um, again, not to say that anything that exists outside those rules won't succeed. It's just that this is a, how you make better bets. To have a better reward. Yeah, I was just waiting to reset the camera. So <laughs> let me pivot a little bit the subject. <laughs> So we touched a little bit. You got me into a rant. I wasn't. I wasn't waiting for the camera to stop to take a drink. <laughs> that was purely coincidental. <laughs> we touched a little bit the like, the people that are in your company. Uh, why don't you run your own startup? Why are you working for somebody else? Pretty much, pretty much anyone inside our organization could walk out the door tomorrow and found a company. We have a, a, a whole team full of entrepreneurially minded and talented people mm-hmm. from developers, designers, strategists. Um, the, the, well, what's true for me is I find more value in working together with that crew. Uh, I'm much more interested in what we can do together as a team um and for me being here in stockholm essentially closing that eight hour productivity gap between australia and and the us on the one hand it's really frustrating because i spend a lot of time working early mornings and and working late at night you you see me walk in <laughs> at like 11 o'clock or lunchtime or in the afternoon sometimes and uh and and sometimes i leave early or or Sometimes I play SimCity on my phone, but the reality is I, I pull a lot of a lot of hours that are really unsociable yeah. with like 6 a.m. meetings sometimes or uh, 11 o'clock meetings. I have, a, I have a very beautiful and wonderful and patient wife <laughs> <laughs> uh, who, who tolerates maybe a little bit too much, but um, but for me, there's something special about that. We can do... We can do things that a lot of companies our size can't. We're only 30 people across the three countries, across the three offices. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're quite, we're small enough to still be nimble and still be one team, but we're big enough to be um, Powerful. global. And yeah, and, and means that we can run projects literally around the clock around the world and we can hand off and off and off again until it comes back around full circle. Um, watching that engine room just do what it does and and watching it uh the the kind of products that come out the other end i could easily run my own startup if i wanted to i I don't i I get more enjoyment out of being involved with this this group of people and um we don't hire people very quickly we don't hire people uh left right and center we we make pretty slow and pretty considered decisions around who comes into the organization and uh it it means we're left with a a pretty tight-knit crew that really does feel like it's corporate cliche when you start to say it like this, but it feels it feels like family. These are guys that I would um, I would put a lot out for when I, when I was um, back in Australia. Actually, for the last project I was in in Brisbane for, I stayed in my boss's spare bedroom, mm-hmm. and, and it's just kind of felt like a natural thing to do. It's you know we 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 would do that. I don't have a spare bedroom here, but uh, if I did, I would do the same thing for other colleagues who who came here. Of course. That's really cool. So 
what characteristic does one need to have to be considered employed by you? Um, more than more than anything. So any any HR, generally speaking, any HR interview or, or job interview only asks three questions. Mm -hmm. Can you do the work? Do you have the skills or capability? Are you, you know, do you, do you have the, the functional ability to do what we need to get done? Mm -hmm. Will you do the work? Are you motivated? Um, is this the right step in your career? You know, are you treading water because you're bored? Are you, do you want this kind of job because you can do it and you're not looking to advance your career? Or are you not, have you never done this before? And this is a step up for you. And this is a step, you know, so what, what is, you know, can you do the work? Will you do the work? And could I be bothered working with you? And, and that, th that third, <laughs> pick the wrong finger. The third one, the third one is more powerful than either of the first two. The first two are important, but the third one is powerful. Um, because the third one is about that cultural fit and that vision fit more than anything. We are looking for people who align with our vision. So would you be, would you be willing to hire somebody that doesn't necessarily have the skill to do the job, but is highly motivated and fits into your culture? People that don't have the skills, but are highly motivated and fit in the culture kind of become part of our network. And actually once upon a time, I was that person. <laughs> yeah, because if you don't have a skill, but you are motivated and you really yeah. fit in, you will get a skill pretty pretty fast. Sh maybe, maybe. Um, so I'm going to give an example of this based on my own experience mm -hmm. of me the first time I applied for a job at Joseph Mark. Okay. It's about, I think it's five years before I actually started with Joseph Mark. And I emailed Ben and I, Ben Johnston is our, our CEO and, and co-founder. And... Um, we had a we had a great conversation, a great back and forth email. He was very friendly, and we had we had been we had known each other before I I reached out to him. Mm -hmm. um, and what what Ben was able to do was say no very bluntly, but in a way that was very um, respectful, and mm -hmm. in a way that made made sure that we continue to have a. A relationship of sorts now i was in the same kind of mindset i was thinking in the same kind of space as ben and um the, the guy is a next level visionary so i'll never i'll never claim to be at the same level as him uh but but a lot of the things that i have been thinking about for a long time uh he's one of the only other people that that is on the same page with that so i i really respect that but so we had that mental that, that philosophy alignment even at, at that point. But at the time, I had no digital skill. I had no strategy. I My, my background and training was industrial design and, and product manufacturing, like injection molded plastic and, and things mm -hmm. like that. So I didn't really have... Ben emailed me back and said, paraphrasing, hey, you look like you do great stuff. Um, unfortunately, we're not in a position where you've got the skills or experience that we need someone to have in, in that role so let's keep talking and let's just see what happens and five and, years later. and that was it. Yeah, it took five years it took five yeah. years or, or whatever it was for that uh for that dot to finally connect and um and and in the five years in the meantime i had been on, on a journey and joseph mark had been on a journey and uh joseph mark was a different organization five years later and i was a different professional and i had i had had different experiences so that's that's kind of how we would treat that if somebody was like smack dang yeah you know, smack bang down the middle of what we wanted from a personality or for a culture fit point of view but wasn't really able to perform at the level we need them mm -hmm. to yeah we we can't really afford to bring people on and and train them up from scratch um, if they're if they are pretty close and they're you know they're really good and you can see that there's opportunity and room for development but they've got a grounding in in what we do then that's a much easier thing to do we, we bring people in and train them up out yeah 100 we do that all the time but if they are mm -hmm. if they're if they're worlds apart from a, a, a skills background then um then you know we'll we'll find a way to to see how it makes you know how we'll find a way to engage that makes sense for all parties yeah Maybe not straight away, 
maybe you know, maybe, maybe at some point. But also, we hire pretty non-standard people. <laughs> uh, so so it's not like you have to be a developer or you have to be a uh, a, a copywriter or, or a designer to to get in you know to to, to land a job at Joseph Mark um, and and that's changing as well as we stand up more of these vertical venture labs because all of a sudden we're needing now specific skills in things that we didn't need before so we we look at a future of work awesome perhaps we need um, uh, an, an interior architect, someone who's been designing workspaces before. Perhaps we need someone who's been working with freelance scheduling or gig economy. You know, we haven't had people from those kinds of worlds before because that hasn't been where we've been playing. But as we reach into to new venture labs, we find more um, unexpected uh, unexpected job requirements, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Like all the things that you're saying are super interesting to me. And I would probably ask you questions the whole night. Nobody would want to uh, hear <laughs> that. So let me just reset the camera and let's go to the, some final, final line. Fine. No, how do you say that? Cl- clo- closing line? Some, closing questions? Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just telling, giving an example of a, a, a an, an unfortunately awkward uh, workshop experience. Thanks to time zones, we had a, a client who we had, we were running a four hour workshop with. We do it. We do it. A four hour is like a half day workshop, or if we do a full day workshop, it's about um, you know seven hours or, or six or seven hours split with an hour or half an hour lunch break. Um, so these guys had a half hour, a half day workshop, and they we we had given them a proposal for options to start the workshop at either two p.m. Brisbane time or or midday Brisbane time, and he wanted to start it at at ten a.m. Mm-hmm. Ten a.m. Brisbane time works out to be, mm-hmm. I think it was winter time or. or I can't remember the daylight savings. It was something like two o'clock in the morning. He wanted to start the workshop. (laughs) And I was like, I am not running a four hour workshop from two o'clock in the morning. I think, I think we eventually got it and negotiated it to start it at 4 a.m. And I participated, participating remotely in a workshop from like a a Skype or or Google Mm -hmm. hangout sucks. (laughs) <laughs> in the first place right it, it is it is very different like workshops are supposed to be collaborative you can you, as a facilitator you want to see body language you want to be able to react spontaneously to how people are are, are reading or, or perceiving certain things um, it's very difficult to do that with any kind of authenticity when you are uh, you know staring into a computer screen and you've got the pixelated tiny view of everyone on the in the conference room, um, it was it's re- it's really hard. You can do meetings uh, in you know, via video conference. That's that's less uh, troublesome. But running a workshop is is really really difficult because it requires a lot more. Um, it's almost like circumstantial awareness, you know, spatial awareness of of what's happening in the room, how everyone's energy levels are, and and uh, and, and it also really helps to to get everyone invested in the activity by physically getting up and playing on the whiteboard or, or mm-hmm. with the post-it notes or whatever it is. Really hard, really, really hard to participate in a workshop or to lead or run a workshop from the other side of the world on a on a Google Hangout or, or a Skype. In the middle of the night. Exceptionally difficult when it starts at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And and the hilarious thing is, this is only a little while after I arrived in Sweden. This is a a, a month a month or two after I'd arrived in Sweden, and I, I knew a bit of Swedish. Um, I know more now than I did then, but I, I wasn't a complete novice. But what I didn't know is what the words were 
on the instant coffee tin that I bought. So I bought a, a jar of instant mm-hmm. coffee the day before, and I, there was this word, and it looked like it was a nice label, and looked like it was a good product. And the, I thought the the free bar part was like uh, for like fair trade, or it was like you know a, an ethical thing. And when I got home and I showed my wife, she told me, and her face dropped, and she's like, "That's decaf." <laughs> So for a four-hour workshop starting at four o'clock in the morning, I only had decaffeinated coffee to you know to energize me. Effect could still work on you uh, if your wife wouldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about placebo is you need to not know it's a placebo. Exactly. <laughs> so I had I had decaf coffee to wake me up for a four a.m. workshop for four hours, and it was just a mess. It was uh, it was so b- I I yeah it was not great. Um, so I try and I try and change that and avoid <laughs> avoid <laughs> avoid those kinds of early morning conversations. I'll have meetings. Meetings are fine. I I can just talk in meetings. I can even turn the camera off. That's that's great. Um, never run a workshop <laughs> 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 from four a.m. in the morning from the other side of the world via video conference. Yeah. Just in case you hadn't already worked that out before doing it, I I learned that lesson the hard way. Yeah, you know, from the beginning, it doesn't sound like a good idea. Look, it, it it wasn't a great workshop, <laughs> um, and and the way that I see these things is that that goes into my learning experience bucket. <laughs> yep. Uh, we we've had lots of successes uh, in my personal my 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 professional life, and Joseph Marcus had its share of successes as well, and we've also both had our share of learning experiences. <laughs> <laughs> both are good. Both are important. Uh, it, it's it's worth having a, a, a thing go wrong and not learn from it. So, yeah, of course, important important to uh, to take the wheel. And, and we had a, a very very strong debrief after that session to uh, to get clear on how to improve things going forwards. Yeah, that that's great thing that you said. That one of my favorite things to say is that you either like in any situa- in a, any given situation you either win. Or you learn, like actually, you never, you never actually lose. Like you lose only if you don't take the lesson out of the failure. But at, as long as you learn from the there's there's another there's another component to that actually that I a friend of mine shared this this week and I I really resonate with it. Um, and he said, or it was a quote that he had stolen. I can't remember, but it was something along the lines of, "You when you identify." the pattern repeat the pattern repeating or the circumstance repeating and your behavior is changed that's when you know you've embedded the lesson you haven't just learned it you don't just know it from a knowledge point of view Mm -hmm. you've actually made the change and that's where that's quite smart it's actually really cool because i I don't i don't really you you talk about learning lessons all the time that's great you can know stuff and from you have good knowledge and still do dumb things People smoke or people take snus all the time. They know it's going to give them cancer or they know it's going, you know, it's not great for their health. They still do it. Like the knowledge doesn't necessarily change the behavior. When you acknowledge that this, when you, when you can see the pattern repeating and you've actually changed your behavior Uh in the way that you learned, that's when you know that you've gone beyond just knowledge and you've actually changed and grown yeah it's like the same with this trap of uh, self-development and reading books and listening to the podcast like it gives you shit totally bullshit as long as you really actually Uh, do something about that well that's it and so okay that reminds me of a, a, a thing that i say a lot about strategy i am a strategist right that's my job is to design the strategies i work on the strategy for joseph mark i work mm. on the strategy for made in the now i work on strategies for our clients and for our ventures right that's what i do day in day out you're a damn general like like a, like admiral in the army well the problem is execution good good execution with no strategy has a chance of working. Mm-hmm. Good strategy with no execution is a PowerPoint deck. It will not achieve anything. You need to actually Fuck, do this something. Is so good. You need to actually execute. This you need to do so something. Good. That that resonates with me so much. 
because <laughs> I so many times I I like I, I, I love to create the spreadsheets and like plans and make graphs on how I'm gonna do something but the problem is to actually do it not just to plan doing it and the only way you can do that is just do it you know, yeah without exactly. you know, Nike I'm sorry yeah you, know, you can have that one for free um you, you just you just have to get started yeah and and this is why I I like I like what you're doing here you know this is not uh, some people would plan for months and they would buy expensive equipment and they would get the full stands and the soundproof rooms and yeah. they, would, they wouldn't have made anything in the meantime you're doing it and that's awesome because you if you, you if you don't do it then you're just gonna fuck around <laughs> yeah. with with plans and excel spreadsheets and powerpoint decks and you're gonna know what you could do but you, you won't have actually done it and you don't you get a different kind of learning experience from actually doing it yeah like i especially but in the po- irony in this is that i've just explained a whole methodology around how we do things uh from a, a building and executing mm-hmm. uh digital ventures with predictability and with reliability as opposed as an alternative to the startup or the entrepreneur journey and i'm also sitting across from you telling you that i'm i'm impressed with the entrepreneur journey that you're on <laughs> but I, I think that's important to to call out as well because i'm not against entrepreneurs i'm not against entrepreneurism mm-hmm. i think i think if you're going to do that then that's an individual thing what we bring is is a corporate thing what we bring is a uh, a professional thing and if you're going to do it the individual way that is awesome go on fucking do it <laughs> yeah of course and i mean especially in poland i i got to the point where i actually met some awesome people some amazing entrepreneurs like you know rich people people that made awesome stuff and there is one thing in all of them in common is that they have an idea and before you actually look around they start freaking doing it the yeah. doing is the key yep yeah. there's he's cliche because he's been one of youtube's biggest crazy sensations but there's the mm-hmm. casey neistat video which is just called do more yeah and i love that because that's the point just do it yeah just just make something happen wow cheers to that i finished i finished my booze so <laughs> cheers to that with apple juice <laughs> na zdrowie na zdrowie score okay we can't we can't ramble about that around all the, <laughs> the whole evening so there is there is one subject i want to talk with you about um that's important mm, for me and for this uh show how was your moving to sweden how did it go through as an australian moving to sweden and you know do you, do you want a short answer <laughs> <laughs> Because, because, so we, it's kind of all entangled, right? And my journey to Sweden is why I have this job. And my mm-hmm. job right now defines a lot of my lifestyle. And so, and, and also coming to Sweden is, is, is difficult. A lot of people don't immediately get a person number, a personal number or a pin. And you need a pin to get a job, but you need a job to get a pin. Yeah, so, I got, I got it after one year. Yeah, and it can be an absolute nightmare. So, so having the job, I, I I don't want to talk about work all the time, right? Because I do have a life that is not my work. But also having the job, the way that I have it right now, is a very important part of my life because that's what allowed my my transition into Sweden to be relatively comfortable, mm-hmm. um, time consuming, <laughs> but comfortable. So I was actually my wife and I were were living with fiance at the time um, in the UK. And my company in in England decided to not sponsor me, claiming that they could. Uh, they, they they said that from a HR perspective, they needed to prove that they could not find somebody with my skills or experience in England, mm-hmm. or or the UK, 
or the EU. And they said, we don't want to do the paperwork for that. We'll just hire somebody new. That was a mistake. Not in my opinion, but three months later, my boss came to me and said, we're having a really hard time finding a replacement for you. (laughs) Would you be open to us sponsoring you? And by that time, that was three months down the track. We had already had an application in for Swedish residency for three months. So I, I said, I'm flattered. I'm frustrated. But no, <laughs> it's, it's too mm. late for that. Now, at the time, Swedish migration had ballooned out of all control. People had been uh, moving to Sweden uh, and, and refugees and asylum seeking. So the Swedish migration office had no real ability to to withstand the influx of of applications that they had to go through. Um, Sweden has a traditionally very progressive approach to to immigration and asylum, and they wanted to look after and care for everybody. And that kind of uh, eventually, that that system burst at the seams. They they were not set up to to support it. I'm not sure what your transition into Sweden looked like, but... No, inside the... Poland's part of the EU, so you you just walk across the border. I just came I and I said, I'm here. I I put an application in and I gave them every last bit of evidence. I gave yeah. them I gave them Skype conversations that they really probably did not want to have to read <laughs> between me and my wife. Um and it took us they they immediately came back to us with a, a sort of automated website that says your waiting time is expected to be between it was something like fourteen and sixteen months. Uh, and I only had a few months left in, the, in on my visa in the UK, so we didn't have the ability to move from England straight across to Sweden. So uh-huh. we had to go back to Australia. My wife got a, a working holiday visa uh, because you can get that really quickly for Australia. Um, and so we're like, let's let's pray that my residency gets approved, mm-hmm. and it gets approved before uh, her working holiday visa runs out. Otherwise, yeah, it messes our whole right. system up, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we both went to Australia. Um, she was on a, a 12-month uh, working holiday visa. Um, and and I went looking for work. I was like, <laughs> I, I need a contract. I need, yeah. I can do some work. I can do you know, a couple of months of contracting, six months contracting or, or, or something while I, while I wait for this. Um, I had a, a couple of friends who worked in in high offices, in in corporate offices in Australia, and a couple of friends who worked in design studios, and and a couple of friends who were in recruitment agencies. So I was I was pretty confident that I would land something. Um, and out of out of nowhere, oh god, this is hilarious! Actually, it wasn't out of nowhere. Should I reset the camera before you start? Maybe, maybe actually. <laughs> Give me a second. Okay. Sorry, this is this is an unexpectedly long answer to what you thought was going to be a simple question. Yeah, I was supposed I mean I was supposed to be finishing. <laughs> I, 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 but, but no, this, but uh, this it, is it's great. Come on, go so, on. So so um again, this is an unexpectedly long answer for what should have been a simple question, but so this is interesting because it, it comes back to doing something. So mm-hmm. for context. <laughs> I will come back to the point of the story. But for context, when I finished my university degree, I studied industrial design and pretty much the, the I had an internship while I was studying. The day after or the week after that I, I finished my course, the company that I was interning at, the, the industrial design consultancy, closed its doors. Mm-hmm. There, uh, traditionally, you do, you're a student, you might do an internship while you're studying or afterwards, and then you'll get a job at that company and that's your career pathway. Um, and, and, and at the time, this is... Uh, it was a particularly troubling time for design in Australia and a lot of manufacturing had closed. The, um, I, I, I was out of a job. So I, I worked a couple of different jobs and a couple of different contracts. And in the meantime, I wanted to make sure that I continued to show up in the design industry. Um, I, man- I wanted to maintain relevance. And so what I did is I mm-hmm. took uh, an industrial design so- university society called Sprout, which had previously been specifically for drinking. <laughs> and I changed it into becoming an event series. And it was still about drinking. You could go and get cheap beers at a nice bar because we would do it on a weeknight where they would get no people. And I said to the, I said to the owner of the bar, look, if I bring 
50 people to your bar on a Thursday night. Will you do half price drinks for us? And he he gave me an offer for some deal. He gave us the venue for free. He gave us the projector and the lighting and the stage and uh, yeah, all of the venue sponsorship for free. Mm-hmm. We, spo- we we promoted his, his venue and we brought a lot of people to it and took great photos and all the rest of it. Um, and once a month for, you know, every... Once a month, every month for about two years, we would have a different industri- you know, prof- professional practicing designer from somewhere around Brisbane would come and talk about what they were doing or their career pathway or mm-hmm. what they were excited by. And we pumped this out through the communication networks at the university to other design studios. People professionals wanted to come and see what their competitors were doing Mm -hmm. students wanted to come and see and basically beg anyone for a job and and academics just wanted the booze (laughs) (laughs) so it actually meant it 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 hit a whole bunch of different um sides of of the community now when i got a, a a job in melbourne i had to leave brisbane i needed somebody else to run that community so i passed it on to a couple of younger kids they they ran a couple of events um, for the in the following few years, and then it eventually fizzled out from having a physical presence. The whole time, it maintained a Facebook group, mm-hmm. and that Facebook group still to this day, like uh, six years, six, seven, eight years down the track, is still um, it's still populated with content. Right, people are still wow. posting to it. Jobs, questions, uh, people are right. You know, it's it's still it's still active. And I got back to Australia. Um, and this is five years after I'd applied to, to Ben at Joseph mm-hmm. Mark originally. I get back to Australia. I'm talking to my recruitment agents. I'm talking to my friends in corporates. And I see on Sprout, up on Sprout, my, my Facebook group that I started yeah. years ago and somebody else manages now, somebody put a job ad up. Uh-huh. It was for a seven-month contract uh-huh. because somebody at Joseph Mark was going on to maternity leave. She was having a baby. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, that's one of my favorite companies. I love these guys. <laughs> seven month contract. It's a contract so I can work for seven months while I wait for my visa. Exactly. And then I can go to Sweden. And I can work out how the hell I get a job in Sweden. And uh, um, I, that, that, that just looks perfect. And, and what they're looking for is what I've been doing at, at Vodafone when I was in the UK, you know, the product strategy and and that was what the job title was all about. Dude, so it's like I know, right? And this is this is <laughs> what I say. Like so Sprout was a thing that I I needed to when I was a graduate without a job, I needed to find a way of making sure that I was important to the community, to the industry and I wanted to have a cheap booth. Yeah, that too. Uh, but but it was it was mainly about finding and yeah. I got I got jobs from and I got contracts from running it when I was you know, back back when I launched it, um, but it was never really about that for me. It was never really about me getting a job. It was more about making sure that I stayed because my my greatest fear at that point was that I think I was still working at a supermarket, mm-hmm. and my greatest fear was that I've just finished my university course and I'm going to go work full time at a supermarket and I'm going to hate my life, and yeah. it's, it's all over. Or I'll move back to I'll move back in with my mom and uh, all my professional dreams will go up in smoke. For me. That was an event that I had no money, I had no budget to create that event. I created that all completely just by getting other people to pay for things or other people <laughs> to drop. We took we took no cover charge. The people came and spoke for free. I think the most it cost me was a bottle of wine to say thank you to the uh, to the speaker. That's and, so and that was it. cool, man. And so cool. And again, like just do it. Just make something. And would you say that, like? You, you have you have no idea how what you make today mm-hmm. is going to impact you in ten years' time. Exactly, because all we are doing here it might be just putting out this small seed in the ground, and we are living it. Yep, and we have no idea what it might happen in five years with that. Hundred percent. It can save our asses. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. It can it can save your ass. And look, I was I was with this contract, seven month contract. It was looking to finish yeah. up at a certain date, and and then I was like, cool. Um, it, Wait, contra- don't tell me that they said, hmm, we are thinking about opening a branch in Sweden. No, it was the other way around. Uh, uh, you I, offered? 
No, no. Well, I, I walk. <laughs> I, so I walked in on day one, and yeah. Ben didn't interview me. His so the the company is run by the husband wife duo Ben and Jess. Um, uh-huh. Jess, Jess. So why is it called Johnson and something? Joseph Mark. That's yeah. that's a mystery. It's Ben, just so Joseph. Se- separate... Okay, let's not start another subject. Maybe that's let's finish with the who is who is Joseph Mark, is the greatest mystery of all time. Uh huh. That's our Twitter handle. That's our Instagram handle. Who is Joseph Mark? If you t- if you find the answer to that question, you you ask me if you got it right, and I'll let you know. Okay. Ah, you tell me that's, if that's you work out right. who Joseph Mark is. Anyway, if if anyway. I if I find what Joseph Mark is, would you hire me? <laughs> it would come back to what you want to do, your philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about this. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's get back to the story. We are in Australia, so, seven month contract. So Ben didn't play any role in the recruitment process. He didn't interview me. Yeah. Um, I, I interviewed with Jess. I interviewed with the, the HR director at the time, Megan, and, and a bunch of other mm-hmm. um, aw- awesome cats. I was interviewed by the lady who was going on maternity leave. Um, and when I walked in on day one, Ben stood up and he's like, I thought I heard a rumor that you were coming to, <laughs> to work for us. And I was like, yeah, well, yeah, don't, don't get too excited. It's only a short-term contract. If you, uh, if you want to keep me, you'll have to open an office in Stockholm. Uh. <laughs> Fa- famous last words, right? <laughs> uh, about about three months before the contract finished up, Ben and uh, a couple of the the senior leaders in the company pulled me into the boardroom and and just said, "Look, it's what we're doing together is really good. What we're building is is going in the right way. Um, we would be interested if you would be interested in opening an office in Stockholm." Wow. Um, so. When I started an industrial Man. design social drinking group <laughs> to try and stay relevant to the industry, I had no idea at that point as a uh, desperate to not fail student or graduate, I had no idea that that was going to lead to me ending up in charge of a venture lab studio that is working with some of the biggest companies around the world. Man. Would if, never have had a clue. If only you know you knew what are you doing with my mind right now with this story. <laughs> like... It's boom. So, <laughs> just do it. Wow, that's cool. I guess there is not so much to say after this story. <laughs> <laughs> Let me reset the camera for the last time. All right. I've I've had a fun career. <laughs> and you have still have a lot in front of you, right? Totally. I, I, I... How old are you? How old do you think I am? 35. 35? No, man, I'm joking. Are you? Are you? <laughs> no, I said 35, but then I looked at your hat, and no, <laughs> this dude is not 35. You know, you know, you know I wear the hat because it hides my horribly receding hairline. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just your forehead going, like, you know, going forward. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no... Like I, 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 you know, for me saying that you are forty, it just gives my mind pleasure that oh, I still have a time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm how old uh, are you? I'm thirty. Thirty-one this year. That doesn't give me a lot of time. <laughs> you, ev- everyone has the exact same amount of time, but also everyone else moves to their own pace. Yeah. There is no, true. there is no value in measuring yourself by anybody else's time scale or or pace uh because their, their story is not yours it's hard to avoid that right sure it's it's hard to avoid but it's hard to avoid lots of things you know the 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 people who are in the best emotional places work very hard to avoid the traps you know the the, the mm. modern society and why well, i say modern society has been filled with these kind of traps the whole time yeah, for for as long as you can imagine. Yeah, how do you think women feel? Society's filled with traps for women to feel bad about themselves and their bodies. You know, the the women that have pure yeah. confidence work really hard to to build that. So, um, to not destroy that. Yeah, to 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 not fall into the trap exactly. of comparison yes. or of judgment. Yeah, don't don't worry about that. Um, every every single individual. Is and and the the thing that makes me 
thing that gives me perspective on this is remembering that none of it matters. No, none of this matters. This is that's true. Yeah. We're just we're just you know highly evolved yet flawed blobs of meat and intelligence <laughs> floating around a watery rock uh, that spins around a giant gas ball that's floating through space. In the grand scheme of the entire universe, this shit doesn't matter. Uh, my wife's a geologist. Yeah, and, but- and her her world and her work exists on timescales that make our dramas and our bullshit completely irrelevant. But I don't care about the bullshit that is out there. Like, I don't care like the stars that are you know millions of light years from us. Like I care about what's here and what's now. You know. Then then only do what's here and what's now. Don't don't do what was or what is for me or for anybody else. Do it for you. Do what's here. Do what's now for you. Because the minute you compare, the minute you lose focus. And that's the last minute. Your life your life is not about my life. Your life is not about comparing to me. And you're doing things that I wish I, I had done. Uh, as, as is everybody else. It's very easy to look at somebody else's social media or Instagram page and, and see something that you wish you could do or you wish you had done, or be upset that you don't have time. And there's an irony in that the more time you spend complaining that you don't have time, the less time you have to do what you want to do. So don't lose any energy focusing on anyone else. I don't mean that in a in a narcissistic way. I mean... It's about doing. It's about doing. And, and do what you want to do for you and find a way to make that work in, yeah. in the world. There's an Alan Watts philosophical speech that talks I about... I love that guy. Sorry? I love that guy. Oh, he's, it's, he's, just, so, he's so his good. His voice, just his voice, and not even what I, he's saying, just brings you another level. Yeah, he's, he's continue. brilliant. It was, it's something about, um, you know, do, do what you want. Do, what, do you, what do you really want to do? Um, and I think it's a brilliant philosophy. I, I can't remember the entire quote, and I'll get it horribly wrong if I try and remember it right now. Just paraphrase. No, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll I'll ruin it for you. It's it's something along the lines of um, do do what you feel or do what you like. Um, by by Alan Watts says YouTube uh, people do like supercuts and put motivational imagery behind the back of it. It's yeah. worth watching. It's worth or, or listening to the quote again or, or just reading it out. It's it's a fantastic quote. I have found um, it out. It's it's sort of one of those things that deserves to be written uh, on on a wall in a a startup headquarters. <laughs> motivational thing. I will put that on my wall on Instagram or something like that. I look I look forward to uh having a follow up interview with it in the background. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Man, we have to finish. Like I, I had the I had the whole set of questions for you at as the like finishing, like slowing down, but it's impossible to slow down with you, so we have to cut it off. I get yeah, I, I probably sh- I probably should go. <laughs> my my wonderfully beautiful, loving, patient, patient tolerant <laughs> wife is probably going to become less tolerant very quickly yeah i'm not starting a good relationship with her <laughs> she'll just get mad man thank you for that you're you're most welcome this has been fun for so many levels the things you said were just pure awesomeness i'm sorry i broke your script or your questions <laughs> no that's 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 the best thing that could happen actually yeah i mean instead of I just giving me a title of a good book. You gave me a Alan Watts. The the prob the quote. problem that I have is I talk, uh, and it means that I don't I don't naturally wind these things down very well. So I'm just going to do it abruptly and say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if I don't stop you, you could just go on and on and on. It's my own fault. So I I'm conscious of that, right? I've had my own learning experience. So I'm 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 now going to say uh, I I appreciate the time that you are. I, I appreciate you inviting me for this. This I has been fun. I appreciate your time and your knowledge and your wisdom. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the next one. Yep. Thank you for watching or listening to this episode. I hope that you took a great lesson from it. And if you liked it, 
Don't forget to subscribe, comment, or leave a review. I can't wait to read that. See you next week. You're awesome. And remember, whether you're starting a new company or you need some design or marketing services, Media Brew is always there for you. Go to mediabrew.se. M E D I A B R O.se. And check how awesome this company is.